Hi, I want to welcome everybody to the, uh, I don't even know what number this is in our series of unforgettable dinnerware uh, Zoom lectures presenting various aspects of dining and tabletop and all of that. And before I launch into tonight's topic, I'm doing my usual housekeeping things. Uh, one, you're muted. Uh, we don't see your faces. It's being recorded and you can watch, your, watch everybody else but yourself again later. Um, and I wanna thank the Ann Arbor District Library for hosting this event and uh, helping us uh, celebrate dining. And uh, oh, one other thing, if you have questions during this presentation, you can write them in the chat and, uh, and then they'll be addressed at the end of the presentation. So before I introduce our illustrious guests this evening, speakers, I'm giving a plug for the museum. Um, if you haven't joined this year, join, support us. You'll get the newsletter in the mail, but not this one, you'll get the new one that's coming out. And I wanna give a plug for an exhibition we have that's opening January 7th at Michigan Theater, the historic Michigan Theater in uh, downtown Ann Arbor. And that show is called Dish Night at the Movies. It's about a depression era, wonderful marketing idea that uh, movie theaters and dinnerware manufacturers came up with during the depression where uh, they, uh, what lured is the wrong word, but they, <laughs> they convinced women they should go to the movies. The ladies should go to the movies by giving them a free piece of dinnerware, um, a gravy boat or something else uh, when they went to the movies. So if they went to the movies enough times, they would get a whole set of dinnerware. And this was wonderful because it convinced people to go to the movies and it also uh, got the dinnerware that wasn't moving too rapidly right then out to the public. So that is going to be our exhibit at Michigan Theater opening January 7th. But um, as for Zoom presentations in January on Wednesday, January 11th, um, kind of a month from now, Kathy Fuller Seeley, who is a film uh, professor and an a film history professor and expert on this topic, will be giving her presentation called Dish Night at the Movies. And um, I hope you can attend that one. So mark that on your calendar if you haven't marked anything for uh, January 2023, mark that one down. And I am actually going to, for once, read this kind of introduction because I think the Sangers wrote the, the, one of the best introductions here I have. So you probably know all this already, but uh, this is what they told me to say about themselves. So Peg and Peter can look at this one. They have sustained a marriage and a very small scale ceramic design and production studio in, since the Nixon administration, if any of us remember when that was, their work has been widely collected from the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Pomona, California to the Starship Enterprise in Star Trek, The Next Generation. Now that's the only time I'm ever gonna get to give that introduction. <laughs> so, um, and their work is widely collected besides at the Starship Enterprise, The Next Generation, which we'll hear about later. Uh, but I wanna thank, um, Peg and Peter for being here this evening and uh, turn it over to you. So take it away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining in tonight. I'm Peter Sanger. And I am Peg Sanger. And I am a partner in this Sanger Porcelain journey. And tonight, Peter is going to give you um, a talk about how a very playful and creative design innovation really changed the trajectory of our work. And it even got us into outer space. <laughs> Thanks, Peg. Let's see if we can get the show on the road here. There we are. Here we are. Here's Peter the Younger. This is uh, about 1975, as it says here. This is our second kiln site. This was a large space that we had with enough room for us and for other artists to have studios. It was a small creative community, community under one roof. I had received my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics and spent about a year working at a Japanese pottery where I learned how to work six days a week throwing pots. Upon returning, I was unable to find uh, you know, any kind of work in the ceramic industry, mostly because the manufacturers were moving production offshore, closing. So I bought some bricks, built a kiln, and began working on my craft. Here, there she is, my partner for over 50 years in this journey. 
Margaret Peg Sanger, pictured here, is well prepared. She has degrees in psychology and special education. Here I am at my homemade kick wheel, throwing mugs in a down jacket in our big space that only had wood stove for heat. I think the beard was for warmth. And after some years, I grew very, well, not very, but I, I grew sort of dissatisfied and sort of frustrated with the limitations of wheel work. One could only work the wet clay for so long and then it would flop. Uh, I wanted more design time, really. I wanted more control. So I explored other techniques for making ceramic objects, starting with hand building. And then I quickly turned to casting. Here's some pictures. I'm gonna show you uh, some steps in my design evolution, if you will. And I'm gonna use sugar and creamers as an example. So on the left, is a basic wheel thrown creamer. Sorry, I don't have a sugar bowl example, uh, but this is just a simple cylinder with a pulled handle and the finger formed spout. But on the right is uh, one of my, maybe my first attempt at hand building with slabs. And, and what's really important about this piece and the reason I've saved it uh, on the right is uh, if you look at the space between the creamer and the sugar bowl, I could see that if I just tilted the the creamer more towards the sugar bowl, I, it would not be that difficult to have these two objects form halves of a cohesive whole. But I knew that I couldn't control the hand building the way I wanted to. So I, I next moved over to, to casting to try. And so on the left is my first attempt, I think it might be my first mold making. And if you look at the space between the, the creamer and the sugar, you can see that I'm starting I'm getting closer, can we say. The, uh, I think the foot, the tray has uh, basically footprints for the, these two objects to sit into. So that space is, is kind of determined by the tray design. But it, it's a rough first start. And if you look on the right with the black uh, version, you can see that I've gotten better with the lines flowing. I've gotten better as a mold maker, I've gotten better as a model maker. And we described the original objects that we make the molds from as, as either our positives or as the model. So I've got more flow, I've refined the tray. It's uh, making progress, but the big breakthrough came in the next iteration here. So on the left is, is what we call the faceted sugar and creamer. And on the right is, surprise, we call it the round sugar and creamer. But the, the real breakthrough with designing the ones on the right, the round ones, is that I was able to get my wet plaster into a balloon and then form it, get it in, sort of in the shape I wanted and then have it set so I could then, uh, <laughs> very organic <laughs> indeed. And it, uh, it also, uh, I didn't, I just had to refine the pieces pretty much and not create them from scratch. So I love the, uh, the fact no handles, uh, just has great flow. And this was a uh, uh, really a breakthrough piece for me. The, uh, it, it attracted a much wider audience in the craft markets. It, uh, sales really jumped. And, and then I would hear people ask me if I knew uh, Russell Wright or Ava Zeisel. And I'll be flat out honest with you, I had to come home and look them up. <sighs> so. Uh, I'll, I want to take a minute here before I march through the, the evolution of the design process. I want to give you a, a bit of uh, background or information about the designing with plaster in balloons. And on the left is a balloon filled with plaster. And you can see on the left side, it's tugged with a string to kind of give it that spouty look. I'm, I'm going to, my intention here is to make a little teapot out of this. So left with the latex, right with it stripped off. Left is uh, developing, roughing in the, uh, the teapot with the handle and the lid. Plasters, I really enjoyed working with plaster because it's easy to carve and subtract, but it also you can do addition fairly uh, easily. The handle is attached. Uh, no, the handle's attached be and the lid is not. So, the lid is, does not adhere to the plaster because I used a separating compound and the, I did not use that when I poured the plaster for the handle. So 
that's really convenient. I can get that lid to fit exactly on top of that piece. So on the right is the finished model of the teapot. You can see I detailed the spout. I refined the handles and the lid, or I put the, the little accent crease in, in the side of it. And if you look closely, like inside the handle, you'll see the little dots. And then the, maybe you can see the faint line that, that uh, connects the dots and the same under the spout. Uh, those are the seam lines. That's where the mold is gonna be a two piece. The mold will, the lid is a separate mold, but the, uh, the teapot is a two piece mold. I'll show you the mold in a second. At, here I wanted you to see the, diff, the shrinkage in the process. The left-hand side is the finished fired piece and the right is the model that the mold was made from. So the, the original cast piece was the size of the model when it came out of the mold and then it, it sh shrank during the, the process to that size. So a quick couple shots of how, the, how you do make a mold. Uh, so we drew the seam lines and then on the left, the model is embedded in a big chunk of clay that up to those seam lines and the cylinders that come out of the spout and, and the top of the teapot will be the holes into which the, uh, the clay will be poured when we get to casting it. And then on the right hand side is the, I boarded it up uh, and then the plaster would be poured into that. Uh, the, the model is fully uh, coated with the separator. Here's the three piece mold, two halves and a bottom. A plaster mold is basically a, a plaster box with a hole in it and the uh, shape of the hole is the shape of the piece you're, you're going to cast. So here's a quick uh, So here's my tea sets I don't want to make. I need a companion for my sugar and creamer. Here's the tea set of uh, the first one with the, the cups that snuggle in and under. The cups don't have handles. It's, it's a clean, round, bubbly, fun uh, piece. And so these two together were the, uh, the beginning and, and kind of the set the, uh, the were the model for the, uh, the fit together design concept that we've been doing all these years. And so everything after these two is, uh, are, are just variations on the theme. So this is the Rhinebeck uh, story and the feature story about the fair from June 23rd, 1983. The uh, piece, this much exposure was just phenomenal for us. The, it was wonderful that the sugar and creamer and the teapot and maybe a couple other pieces in our in our entry uh, fair entry application. Thank you. Uh, we were able to break through because about one in ten applications were accepted to this event, and so back, yeah, back in '83 it was really hard to get into. But once you did, you had exposure to the national galleries who, who all attended, and the, a lot of retail folks came for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so we could. Uh, we could do pretty well. It was a real uh, breakthrough for us. The folk, the one criticism of the tea set is, was the cups did not have handles. So I designed this set. This was the first one with handles and it's the second pot and four cup set, but it's all called the design one. And you can see the, the cups are, are kind of upright and standoffish. So it has a little different tone than the uh, snuggly tea set. But it sold well. They, uh, the mugs are 12 ounces, and it's about a 12 by 12 inch tray. So it's pretty big. Here, this just in this year, on the left is a red knockoff of the Design One. So another 
another uh, box to check here in our journey is we've been knocked off. I don't think they did a spectacular job here, but uh, it happened. But I, I took another bite of the apple and I wanted to uh, see if I could maybe make it a, a tighter design that, that I, I, this is great. You can hear us both, I think. It snuggles. It, exactly. But this is our TV star, right? This is the one that uh, did this. It, it, 1993, season six of Star Trek The Next Generation. The episode was Lessons. The previous season five, there were a couple appearances of, the, uh, of, of our work, but nothing like this. Here's the episode. Here's the scene. Hope you can, this is 90 seconds. The opening credits are running over it. This has been in syndication ever since. And so next April, it will be 30 years of uh, Star Trek and uh, the design too. We didn't find out till, I don't know, a year or so after the uh, work made it, was on the show that it was one of our gallery owners that had sent the work to the show. She was buying and selling our work in her gallery and she thought it would fit and it did. Uh, we wrote to the show, she had written to the show, but the show never responded. Um, that's okay. And uh, we do know that one of the prop shops in Hollywood has one of these sets and maybe some other work. Uh, but it, it's just astounding at the power of television. If, if you were to Google, if you were to Google the card T set design the design tool would take you right to, to our site and uh, right to this piece. Um, it, obvious, it, of course, it's our continues to be our number one selling uh, item. So here we go. Oh, Got to run. Thanks for everything. I think it was her tea set, not his. Oh, you can stop now. Oh, let's see it again. Here we go. So here's the uh, only set where the pot is uh, among the cup and saucer. So it's, the, it's a pretty large piece. It needs a big pot to kind of balance out and work with the, uh, the cup and saucer. Um, I worked on the accent lines on this to you know, get relationships with the cup and the saucer and then the, the pot. The, uh, the footprints are 13 by 13 by about eight inches high. So it's, it's, a, it's a big one. It's no longer, we can no longer produce this. The, the mold wore out. So uh, it's no longer in production. This was another milestone for us. This was a, this was a great break. This is the... Uh, invitation or not the invitation, but the uh, at the show, the art for the table 84 uh, put on by the Association of the American Craft Museum in New York, the museum associated with the American Craft Council. Uh, the napkin on the left unfolded into the, uh, the poster on the right. My piece is the upper center uh, part. Well, my piece is the top row middle. It's hard to see, it's just a little black dot but it, it was just a stunning invitation to get the, uh, to be invited to get that. Can I make that go? Oh, sorry, man. Oh, here we go. Sorry, we're back. Here's the piece. This is the, my entry. Uh, the limited edition, and we called it edition. It was an edition of 25, but for the show, we had uh, to mark it as a mark. We had to submit a, a prototype, and they auctioned that off as their fundraiser. But just one more, one more thing about back here to the no, back here to this. This show was held at the Windows on the World uh, restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center, and Peg and I uh, got to go to that event. Uh, you know. They invited the, so whoever we, they invited us to go, and it was just just a great thing. Dropped the kids at my sister's and went into the city and went up to the top of the world, and never forget it. So here's my limited edition piece, satin 
matte exterior glaze, glossy interior. The, uh, it's nice and compact. It's about 11 by nine by nine inches. As sculptural as I could make it. This, I made this one, this was not made for the craft market like the, the other parts of this, of our work. This, this I made for the museum. I really went all out on it. Uh, I found out later, this is, uh, the image on the left is from the book on the right, the International Book of Lofts by Susan Schlesen. And the interior loft shot on the, on the left-hand side with all the teapots, including our limited edition, is the loft of Jack Lenore Larson, the New York designer. And I think he was president of the Craft Council or the museum or something, but it, I guess he purchased it and, and had it prominently displayed in, in his living space in his loft in New York. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, quite complimentary indeed. So that, that was a fun thing. But, and I'm very grateful to Margaret Carney for getting me to, uh, as inviting me and, and being very patient as I, I finally, as I rooted through the collection, I, I was so happy to rediscover this piece because this is prototype number two. Uh, and I only did it, made one. And I, 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 in reflecting now, I made this one for me because I, I'm a, this is a black porcelain body with no glaze. It's unglazed. The, the black you see is in the clay itself. The interior of the cups and the pot has a, have a glossy glaze on it. But I, I'm really a fan of the unglazed surface because it, it, the lines are so much crisper and it, without that, that glass coating on them, it, uh, it's really I'm, really, I'm really happy I found that again. That was a great discovery. Thank you, Margaret. A little origin story on the black porcelain. On the left is a Wedgwood basalt piece, and on the right is a James Rothrock creamer. Jane, well, the basalt Peg's aunt in Philadelphia had some of that, and she showed it to Peg, Jim, and I when we went up to visit her one time. And Jim was very taken with it, and, and he wanted to expand his horse, his cast porcelain that he was doing, and he he did a highly decorated white body and he thought this black unglazed uh, approach would uh, maybe be something a little more production oriented and less time involved. And I, I helped out with, uh, with some of that work, uh, but I, I am deeply uh, grateful for the experience of working with Jim because he was one of the people in that, that big building and he was casting and I, I went to school on the process. So like when you have the opportunity to watch somebody who's really good at something and, and go to learn about, uh, you can learn a lot. And I did. And uh, that was a great experience. And that's where basically I learned my beginning, my entry level casting techniques. So I did, it, we don't make, not everything's a teapot. Here are two uh, beverage servers with uh, accessory vessels. On the left is, a, we call it the sake set or the uh, uh, cordial set, it, with three different height, small goblets arranged in that kind of array behind them, kind of stair-stepping. On the right is a pitcher with tumblers. The tumblers are identical. They're all the same 12 ounce, they're all the same size and, and the, the height variation comes from the, the stair-stepping of the tray that goes up and around and down. So that was kind of variations on, on that. So what to do? Okay, after you've done that, let's try, how about we try putting the cup and the sugars and creamers and the pot all on one tray? That might be fun. How do you do that? So I came up with this upstairs, downstairs, two story idea. I, I love this piece because of its simplicity with a single handle on the cup then to uh, align with the pot and the lid. It just was nice. It's a nice look. The, uh, it has two accessory vessels. They're both kind of little pitchers, but they snuggle in under the front and you can pick it up by its, the handles there. Uh, this piece is in the American Museum of uh, Ceramic Art in Pomona. And it came, it, it got, originally the, this piece, the service, the tea for you service for one was purchased by uh, Spencer Davis, who was the, uh, former editor publisher of Ceramics Monthly. And he, he bought this in another piece for the Ceramics Monthly collection. And then that the Ceramics Monthly collection was then uh, 
combined with the, uh, the American Museum of Ceramic Arts collection. And so you, if you can do it with one cup, how about four? This might be a bit, a lot of handles here. Um, I sort of, anyway, under the spout is, is a sugar bowl and, and behind the, uh, uh, is the creamer on the back on the right there in that photograph. So it's got the four cups on the two-story tray and in the center of the collection is a little tea light. That was a, they used to get a reaction at the show when you lift the pot off and they'd, they'd see the candle. Um, so working out all that, that, that was a lot of puzzling and, and mold making and, and head scratching to do that. This is the last pot and cup set that I made. It's a two cup without a sugar and creamer, I, tea for two. I worked very hard to get that pot to sit either the way it's sitting or 180 facing the other direction and have it fit. And this is without computers and anything else. This is just by hand and by eye and, and working it out until, until it fit. Here they are apart, kind of a tete-a-tete -tete look to it. Um, pretty, pretty much fun. Here, Margaret, I do plates too. Cups and bowls, three sizes, the cup and saucer. The plates are not round. They are, they are slightly oval, as uh, some of you may know. You, you know best when they, when they go in the dishwasher, you can tell that they're, how they are not round. This is a commission. So I did, I've done a few commissions and this is one of my favorite ones because the client was just so willing to, to let me, I, she, all she wanted was she wanted a demi tasse, she wanted a ramekin, she wanted a wide rimmed plate. Uh, this is a dessert set. So the wide brim plate where she could put chocolates and other goodies for her, her guests. And she was fine with the unglazed, this is unglazed white porcelain with a uh, clear gloss liner in the cup. And again, so all the lines are, are, are have that crispness that I really like. And they, the pieces have been, I know you, a lot of folks have this tactile uh, uh, issue with unglazed ceramic, but if you, if you sand it, a wet sand, a wet dry sand, that one can get the surface down. So uh, it, it, yeah, it, velvety, thank you though. That's it. But the, there was another challenge to this design. She wanted, she gave me this uh, hand blown glass to, uh, she wanted it to be able to fit into that slot. I mean, she wanted a holder. She didn't, she abhorred the, uh, the plastic clip-ons for holding a goblet on a, on a buffet plate. So I had to uh, figure out the shrinkage since the, the pieces are bigger when they, in the cutting for that slot would have to be done while the clay is soft and it gets smaller as it fires, as we saw with the model earlier. The, uh, uh, it was a little challenging to work that out, but we did, it was great. So, okay, that in these last few slides, I, I, I just wanna show you uh, a variation I, I kind of challenged myself. I could do the repetitive reproduction with all the design control and, and, and having things fit together and be interchangeable and replaceable and, and, and all of those wonderful attributes that casting multiples allows. But I also wanted to see if I could get more work in a direction that would give me one of a kind pieces. And it, it, in my studio that's slip and plaster molds, uh, I had to work with those I wasn't going back to wheels and, and hand building and, and things like that very much. So this is a, a, about a 13 inch across bowl. The molds maybe 15 inches across. And what I wound up doing is, is slip trailing onto the mold surface and then having those slip trails be embedded in the porcelain when I, when I cast it, when I fill out the mold up and they become embedded in there. So the black trail trailings on the mold surface are, are smooth against the mold surface, but on the inside, they're dimensional. They, they have little, you know, bumps and they're raised, we'll say it that way. And so then when I glazed it, glazed the interior with a black glaze, I, I could just scrape off the humps and then you can get the, uh, this kind of effect. It's really lovely when I combine the one of a kind work and the production work to fill a kiln to, to make progress in fire. I, can, I don't have to make a whole kiln full of one-of-a-kind pieces. Uh, 
so I, I, I can turn it over faster and seeing the results, what you think. Ceramics is always that way. Is, is the, you've, you have a vision of what you're going to get out of the kiln and then you get what, you have, what comes out of the kiln. And there's always that reconciliation between uh, what you dream about and what happens. Funny that way. Here's another version of that technique with a heavier, chunkier slip. I can do the, I can adjust the viscosity. You saw when I poured the slip into the mold, how syrupy it was. And I can adjust that viscosity and make it thicker and less runny and get more dimension. This is a, a white on white kind of look. Here's another approach, same molds, thinner trailings. And then I've colored the clay. Have this polychrome palette of of, uh, of slips, and I can I have it thick enough so it's kind of like finger paint. So I'm kind of with just really with my finger, and there's kind of dabbing it into the between the the trailings and against the mold surface, and can create this kind of look, and then and then cast it and embed all of that in the body. And then uh, apologies, Margaret, this is not dinnerware. I know I'm breaking the rules, but the shade here of this lamp is that same three-sided bowl. And you can see the dark arching forms here are where I filled in the trailings that I've put against the mold surface and that they those filled in areas act as a bulb shade. And then the lamp base is uh, black porcelain uh, used with the trailings. The, the bottom of the, the lamp base was a two-part mold where all the clays applied before the mold is joined together. So it's not really a casting. It's a, it is kind of a combo with hand building in there. Finally, this is, uh, this, this is an all white piece. This is all white porcelain. And the dark you see is just shadow. It's just backlit because the light's coming from the other side. But because it has this, uh, these openings, you can, see, you can see into the interior and, and the light loves to bounce around off of those light surfaces on the inside. This is a two-piece now, a two-piece mold. I've got the, the base is that same three-sided bowl form. And then there's, think of it as like a lid with uh, some dimension on it to, so when you put the lid on the bottom, you get the thickness of the rim and you get the, uh, the interior double wall kind of, uh, Appearance, so it's kind of a chunky form, with all, uh, but not, and and light play in there is, is just I'm endlessly fascinated with that. So sorry for the the drop. This is uh, we'll get ready to question time. See if I can get out of this. Uh, let's go back to Zoom. All right, now we just see you. Whoa, okay, we made it. Sorry for the drop there. We had no idea what the what happened there. Yeah, are you there? But oh, we're here. I'm sorry. I'm just sending a couple of the questions that came into my account over okay, to Mark. Great, great. And then uh, her and Bill will be able to read them off to you. Good. I don't think so I need my glasses love. to answer questions. We love that. Thank you so much. It was fabulous. fabulous. You're welcome. Thank you. Hmm? Oh, wait, hold. <laughs> You're Sorry, I was, I was hogging. I was hogging the earbud. So one of the questions that came in is, how do you glaze just the interior? Oh, you 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 hold the cup. You pour the glaze in, smush it around, and dump it out. I, I can't turn this upside down because there's water in it. Uh, but you do the inside first, and Probably YouTube, how to glaze the inside of a cup. <laughs> so uh, when you made the transition from throwing to uh, slip casting, um, I guess one of the things that struck me was that um, I know that you can throw a pot, throw a, a pot in, in a few minutes uh, or several minutes. And then in order to do slip casting, you need to make a model, make a mold, and that can take days, possibly even weeks. Yeah. Uh, how did that affect your, uh, your feeling of accomplishment about uh, making, making your work? 
it, I found it very satisfying to have the time to work on the design because, because I could, I could uh, remove material when I'm making a model. And then if I took too much off, if the line went beyond where I wanted, I could then add more plaster to it to get back to, to, to the lines I wanted. And so many of my models have these skim coats that just have layers that I've kind of been back and forth. And if you mix your plaster right, it's the same consistency and, and you can get the smooth transitions that you want. I, uh, and I, that's the part I was really attracted to. And I could walk away from it and I could come back to it. I could take pictures of it and print it and then look at it. And uh, uh, I liked it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but I liked it. I have a question. Um, how many times have you remade the mold or the master mold for the uh, uh, Picard tea set? That, oh, good, good question. Great question. <laughs> so I, I have made what we call a block in a case for that piece. Some of the other ones that are no longer in production, we, I did not do that kind of work. The, I taught myself how to do that. I, I did it in hydrostone. And I think the reason that hasn't got knocked off is because some of those mold pieces, especially the way I've made them, I think it would be almost impossible to do in rubber. But I've made those, uh, I don't know, four or five times. It's, I, when I go back and look at, at my black and case work, it, it's, uh, it's pretty rudimentary. Uh, but, I, but I, somehow I got there. So Untrained. You mentioned, you mentioned um, where, where you learned about slip casting. Is that also yeah. where you learned about mold making? I, I learned mold making from a book. I, I can show you the the ski. Uh, the two, it's a blue and white book, and the the models, the examples in that book. The, it was the uh, the techniques and all were were spot on, but the examples would uh, they're like a little whale uh, thing for the bathtub. They're all these kitschy kinds of uh, objects, but uh, that's where I learned it from the book. So the question is, um, okay, I guess that's a technical question. What is the resist that you used um, that you mentioned when you were working with the balloon shape? So the, the it's there's a variety of we can refer to it as mold soap. Some people go uh, you can buy there's commercial industrial versions of it. There's uh, Crisco. It can go to Crisco. Can be what I've there's a bunch of different things that basically you you fill the the pores of the plaster and you seal it and you don't allow the two materials to, to adhere. Uh, I was trying to think of uh, another commercial over-the-counter uh, thing. I, I have a big bucket of concentrated malt soap that I can make my, I think I bought it way back when and still have some left. So the question uh, that came in is, are you still producing and do you have a marketing website? Love your design. Sangerporcelain.com is, uh, is our site. Um, we still make things basically from the internet. Like sold the van, don't do the shows. Uh, but we do, we do some things from here still. Rainy days, hot days in the summer, we'll, we'll be inside doing that. So did any of your sets end up being too intricate or complicated that you couldn't just, you just couldn't make them work? Or are you able to make most of your ideas work? I oh, he's not batting a hundred percent. Just saying. <laughs> well, if they don't work, you won't see them. Uh, so uh, you can give up on them after a while. Yeah, I mean, the best way to have a good idea is just have a lot of them, and uh, the, you know, hopefully something will work out. But it's it's the journey of can can we do it? And then getting the plaster into the balloon was like the aha moment. And I was sleeping at my truck at an, at an art show <laughs> when I sat up straight and said, that's how I'll do it. Because you can put water in a, in a water balloon by putting it on the faucet, but you can't get plaster to come out of your faucet. <laughs> that's interesting, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, there you go. So, um, the, the library has been doing what libraries are good for, digging up information. And they've provided a link in the chat for where you can buy mold soap. 
<laughs> uh, posted your website, uh, signingforth.com. Oh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can reach us there. <laughs> yeah. Some other comments. Um, I've never seen slip casting before. Really interesting. Thanks There's for tuning in. Visited you a couple of years ago, and you still had um, some inventory. The question is, you still have inventory? Depends. Depends. <laughs> Limited. Well, we, sometimes we do. You know, depends on what what's available. Well, I mean, you know, we can we can make things. We'll, uh, oh, okay. Here's here's an interesting question. Um, in terms of past history, now that craft fairs are quote dead, how do you feel you would have broken through today? No, I don't think so at all. Uh, yeah, no. I don't think this journey could have happened no. currently. This I, happened at a certain time. Yeah, it, with certain circumstances, right. and uh, it, it's just about that, just yeah. that window. Yeah, I think I, I think about I've thought about that many times. So you don't do TikTok and uh, <laughs> um, I don't. No, I don't do. I'm not real active on the social media. The content, you know, I'm, I don't think the algorithms, my friend. I, I have, you know, cause I'm showing my my geezerness. I think on on some of those things, but uh, no. So um, I think you're aware we've uh, posted a number of. Uh, um, things on Facebook promoting this talk. Yeah. And one of the comments that I saw um, kind of related um, your teapot with the cups to like a, a mother animal with, uh, with the babies yeah. kind of nursing. Is, right. is that something that uh, you thought about as you were developing those designs? That, that, that's an easy association and, and people do it. I do it, uh, the biopromorphic, uh, you know, so yeah, people often comment about about that um, sort of the hen and chicks idea. Yeah. Um, but it, it it just seemed so logical to have that. You know, yeah, that's what you, oh, but, well, they can stay warm. They can snuggle. Hmm? This particular posting wasn't as complimented complimentary as a hen and chicks. It was a sow and piglets. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, there is that. You know. Huh. Picture and okay. Yeah, they're very What's smart. The pigs. The piglets. I had a surgeon once look at the stuff and say, oh, it looks like organs. <laughs> oh, wow. Huh. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's really fun to go do the retail shows and, and meet the people and, and, and get their responses. That that was a real joy to, to uh, have those experiences and that those fairs that really attracted a, a, an engaging audience was, uh, was great fun. And some of my crap show, uh, compadres are in the audience and they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, Peter, I have to ask you, since it, uh, I owned your the black tea set, yeah. since, uh, I bought it in 1990 just mm -hmm. for myself. It's now in the museum's collection. Um, and then this last year I bought the white one. And I think I told you the story about how I stood in Portland, Oregon in a crafts shop, a mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. place. I wish I could remember the name of it, but but anyway, and, I, and I'm not indecisive, and I debated for a really long time, maybe an hour, because I could only afford one of them. Mm -hmm. I wanted the white one. I wanted the black one. I wanted, And didn't you tell me a story about somebody similar to myself at an art fair that, uh, that was- <laughs> we've had, Well, we've had a couple of stories. We, it wasn't, it, not infrequently, someone would be overwhelmed with the choices when I would load the booth up with, uh, a lot of this this work and they they just go around and, and really struggle with trying to choose and some of them would just leave the the famous the famous one was the north jersey couple one was looking at the right side of the booth one was looking at the left and what did they say to each other i think he said to her honey do you think we can do this without breathing heavy <laughs> only in a very new jersey accent can we do this without breathing heavy <laughs> so it was yeah we it's interesting or how about ruth dr ruth oh dr ruth came by one time here in, down in the village belly creative she says as she goes by <laughs> she touches one so it's kind of fun there's lots of there's lots of crap show stories yeah good stories 
she didn't buy it, but she touched it and <laughs> said, "Belly creative." So it seems like uh, we're we're running out of time. Okay. Just checking the um, the comments and, and questions to see if there's anything I missed. And um, here, here's someone who uh, apparently you know is a, a weaver from Delaware. Mm -hmm. uh, says. This is fascinating. I always thought it was magic. Oh, so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. It still looks like magic to me. <laughs> uh, well, I think Zoom's magic is a good. We can edit out the, the long pause, I suspect. Yeah. Yeah. I think that will happen. Yeah. No problem. I'll take care of that. Thank Super. you. Super. Thank you very Super. much. I All want right. to thank you very much, uh, Peter and Margaret, for giving this presentation. It was fascinating, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Have a good thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank Have you, Margaret. Nice it's been great. <laughs> yeah. Shall do. Wine's Bye. on me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll be over. <laughs> okay. Come on over. We have goblets. <laughs>